Well, hello, lovely listeners. It gives me the great honor to welcome Lawrence Fishman today. Lawrence, um, we've never met, but we have um, interacted a lot on LinkedIn. That's where I found Lawrence. Lawrence is really prolific on LinkedIn. He does amazing posts, um, funny, heartfelt, from the soul, um, and just really, really engaging. And he, quite frankly, doesn't give a shit what he says. So I really like that. <laughs> Gotta be a little um, bit careful. Yeah. But... <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. Um, and Lawrence is a, a really successful accountant and entrepreneur. So I'm really uh, excited to hear Lawrence's story about how he got to where he's got to. Um, so Lawrence, thank you so much for being here today. It's a pleasure. It's, uh, it was really nice to be asked and um, check in the post for all those nice things you just said. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, LinkedIn has been a bit of a blessing for me, to be honest with you, um, simply because uh, I have a remit in my, my role as an accountant. I have a remit to generate new business and, and do all those sorts of good things. And the way I used to do that was more conventionally going out and doing the business breakfast, the business lunches, the events, all, all that um, that sort of stuff, which I miss and enjoy, and it's starting to come back. But when COVID happened, we hit a brick wall and I had to sort of, I hate the word, but I'm going to use it. I had to pivot. I had to pivot a little bit and kind of think about how else I could get the brand out there and generate interest in business. So, plus it's fun. Yeah, plus yeah, fun. absolutely. Um, so, <clears throat> What I love to do on these uh, just on these conversations really is to understand uh, what's behind the person and, and how you've got to where you've got to today. Yeah. Um, a little bit about you as a as a younger guy and what your aspirations were and and has it matched up to where you are today and all of that sort of thing and and also you know were there any pivotal moments in your life where you you made some quite you know uh, strategic decisions or big decisions where <clears throat> life wasn't going exactly how you wanted it to go. So over to you. I'd love to hear a little bit of your backstory. So what you're saying to me is this is therapy. <laughs> if you um, want it to be therapy, Lawrence, it can be. It's always, it's always therapeutic when you talk to people about stuff. So um, where do I start? Uh, okay, well, oh, well, let's start by my camera just failing on me. So let me just do that to fix it. And it's fixed it. So, um, so I was a very, very shy kid, which people never believe yeah. say that, but I was super shy. I wouldn't leave my mum's side. I was quite introvert, um, confident in my own circle, but not outside of it. At, uh, at the age of 10, I, uh, was told, <laughs> should we say that I was going to sit an entrance exam for a very good private school, um, in London where there was a lot of competition for places and uh, quite unbelievably, my dad must have paid them an absolute fortune, but somehow I got through um, because I was up against you know, hundreds and hundreds of kids and they only took on two. So I managed to, to somehow sneak through uh, or slip through the net into this private school, which was a completely different world to what I'd ever been used to. Um, and those first few months were seriously daunting. I mean, you know, um, I was in a circle of kids that came from very different backgrounds to me. And I realized that it was the ultimate sink or swim moment. And I had to, I, again, I hate the phrase, but I, I had to sort of man up a little bit and kind of figure out that if I didn't harden and build a little bit of a, a front or a, a mask, I wasn't going to make it. I literally wasn't going to make it. And so over time, I grew as a person and that was huge for me. Was I a classic academic? No. Was I bright? I'd like to think yes. But I was a typical teenage boy. I did a lot of the things that I probably shouldn't have been doing. Maybe nothing illegal. I didn't throw a rubber band. <laughs> terrible. But I just had a lot of fun in my teens and refused to listen to the very good advice I was getting given from people around me and thought I knew best and thought I'd, I'd wing it and get through everything um, you know, flawlessly. And it didn't happen. When I did okay, my GCSEs were fine. But when it came to A-levels, I was too interested in partying and going out and meeting girls and, and do all the things that teenage boys do. And um, so I did not get the A-level grades I wanted, which was the ultimate punch in the gut. It was, you know, it was by no means a disaster because I always kind of put some perspective on it. I didn't fail or anything like that, but the expectation level was here and I did not meet it. And I still remember to this day sitting in my garden and 
genuinely, I'm not ashamed to admit it. I just broke down. I just cried for about two hours straight thinking like, how have I, how have I done this to myself? How stupid am I? I had every chance, I had amazing chances. You know, I was privileged to go to the school I went to and I threw it away. And I sort of promised myself at that point that I was going to become like a mini warrior. I was never, ever going to let anyone down around me. And it's, it's almost a, it's a shackle in some ways, by the way. Here we go. Here's the, ther- here's the therapy bit. Okay. It's a shackle because I couldn't allow myself not to do well. Um, and so from that point onwards, I kind of forced myself to make a success of myself in a nutshell. Wow. Yeah, I can relate to that because I, I screwed up my A-levels as well and I ended up um, retaking them and still didn't quite get to where I wanted to, you know, or needed to be. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I can relate to that because it's what we do, isn't it? Too much time enjoying ourselves or whatever. It's hard at that age. You know, we all mature yeah. at different, um, different rates. And we don't always, we're not forward thinking. It's always about, well, there's a party this weekend, so I'm going, you know, full stop. Yeah. not thinking about well, what what does this mean for me at 23 will I get my graduate position will I find it easy to find a job that wasn't that wasn't on the agenda for me so yeah it's tough so so what did you do then so you didn't get the results you wanted did you retake or did you do something um, different I didn't I still look I had enough to get on I just wasn't you know I was predicted very good grades but didn't get them basically um so I, I carried on um did well at uni went uh, and then with my first graduate position I had I had it into my head that I really wanted to work there's a firm called BDO it was Stoy Hayward at the time BDO Stoy Hayward which is a, a big accountancy firm that had a reputation for being the, for having scale so I liked the idea of being in a big firm I didn't really want big four I, I did a, a placement at EY one summer but you know nothing wrong with EY but it just wasn't my vibe um, but I really liked the, the ethos and the culture that BDO seemed to portray and I knew, unfortunately, I wasn't going to get a place based on my A-level grades because the UCAS points were pretty uh, a pretty critical part of the eligibility requirement. So I remember ringing up the HR department and basically going, they must have thought I was a lunatic. But I rang up and said, look, I really, really want to work for you guys. I don't have the grades. I'm not going to waste my time doing you know, three hours worth of, this, of online application forms. But I want to come work for you over this summer for nothing. Don't pay me. Don't pay me one penny. I will come and work for you for nine, 10, 11 weeks, my whole summer holiday. This is the pre, uh, pre-university pre graduation year. And I just I just really want to get a chance. As I said, they must have thought I was crazy. And they um, accepted it. They let me come in. Um, they paid me expenses, which was better than a kick in the teeth. And I worked my, I won't say the word, but I worked my absolute off that summer. I made sure I put myself in front of everyone I needed to put myself in front of you know, every partner that I thought, right, he might be a decision maker, I need to get in front of him and make sure I impress. I did that. And on the back of that, I still had to do the application process and the assessment days, but that really gave me an edge. And on the back of that, I got my first graduate position at BDO, which was fantastic. Um, Passed all my exams first time, which is no easy feat for anyone out there doing ACA or ACCA. I did ACA. Those exams are brutal. Like you have never experienced anything like those exams. You know, they are so, so tough. Uh, but managed to get through them all first time, which was which was I'm you know, very proud of. And the rest is history. My career really sort of started to explode after that because I, I kind of was always, I remember talking to partners early stage at BDO, there, I won't name names, but there were one or two partners I worked with quite early on in, in my, my career who said to me that, you know, they saw something in me. I was not a, a natural techie. I've never been a natural techie accountant. Um, I'm more about the sort of advisory side of things. Um, but they said, you know, you've got um, you've got some of the ingredients that will take you way beyond some of these guys that you're fearful of because you think they're super technical. Yeah. You will eclipse them. You will eclipse them. And the, the truth is that kind of happened, you know. So not not blowing my own trumpet, but you know, it it, it did happen. Um, so that was nice. Well, uh, that's um, very inspiring because um, not many people would have taken that and and done that, especially not getting paid a penny, um, and especially as you were a self-proclaimed party boy before, that must have been like, oh God, I'm doing all these hours for nothing. But your, I guess your perspective changed nothing. at yeah. that point, yeah. Well, it wasn't for nothing. I knew it's the, um, a lot of people don't like this word, but I don't care, I do. Uh, it was the kind of the hustle in me. I kind of realized that I had to go elbows up because I messed around, that was my punishment to myself. Okay. There, again. 
I had to elbow up and fight my way through the crowd and make sure that that I I made it. You know, I wasn't I wasn't going to accept failing anything from that point onwards. Um, so, do you know where that's come from? I mean, it you could say it came from that moment crying in the garden, but but did it? You know, was it was it there from a younger age than that? Um, look, my my parents always had high hopes for me. So there's always that. Every parent has high hopes for their kids. I've got two kids. You know, I hope they take over the world and, and make massive successes for themselves. So every parent has that about them. Um, so my, you know, my parents, my dad um, is retired now, but he was an accountant. So that there was, and my uncle too. So there was a, you know, that was in the, it was in the DNA to go down that kind of route, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, that was always there. Um, I think some of it's wiring as well. You know, I, I kind of, I don't, I like to do well. It's nice to do well. Uh, it's only, you, you get one crack at life, you know, you only get one crack at life. Uh, by no means am I perfect in any way. There's lots of things I could have done better. There's still things I wish I could have done or, or could do, but I probably won't do. But I think, you know, overall, I look, I look sort of introspectively at myself sometimes and think you've done okay for your age, you know, you've done all right, you've done okay. And that's quite a humbling, nice feeling when you kind of, when yeah. you can look at yourself and go, I'm not ashamed of anything I, I'm, you know, I'm doing now. It's, um, it's all, it's all sort of come together. So when you were, um, when you were a kid growing up, did you always know that you were going to go into accounting because your dad was, no? Opposite. I always swore on everything. <laughs> One job I would never, ever, ever do if you paid me a million pounds. The last thing I'm ever doing, Dad, is accountancy, ever. He used to want me to go and work with him. Yeah, come on, you work, for, you know, once you've got your degree, come work with me. No chance. Absolutely not happening. Um, in truth, 9-11, um, there, was, there was a clue on my age there. 9-11 happened, and all the jobs that maybe I would have been interested in doing weren't there. You know, the, the, a lot of the bigger firms closed down their recruitment processes, they froze hiring in management consultancy and in all that kind of stuff. They just didn't exist anymore. So I had to find a job. You know, I needed, I needed to earn. Um, I needed to do something. So um, in truth, my short-term aim, which again, everyone around me kept telling me was, was the minimum I should be doing, was to get my ACA exams under my belt, get the qualification, and then do what the hell you want. You, know, you want to go and you know, be a gardener or do whatever, not that I did, but you know, whatever you want to do after that, you can go do but get your ACA first. It's a foundation. It's something you can fall back on. It will, no one can ever take that away from you. Um, and I did have moments after qualifying um, where I thought, you know, what am I, what's my next move? I went traveling for months on end just to kind of try and find myself or wherever you, you know, people, people do when they go traveling. And, uh, and when I came back, I realized that actually the things I loved, I love business. I love entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and actually, the bits I didn't like about accountancy sort of fell away as I became more senior, because I'm now pretty much an advisor. I, I kind of I'm an aide to my clients. I um, counsel them effectively on business matters and beyond, by the way. You know, it's, it's, it's we, you get under the skin of a client. So it, it becomes an all encompassing advisory role. It's not just financial. Um, and that side of it, I absolutely love. I didn't enjoy the kind of months on end out on site, number crunching and ticking boxes, you know, but you've got to do that as part of the journey and I, I had a look at your profile and and there was a, a, a time where you ran your own business is that right you did yeah something? I had yeah it was it was um, it was only a short time but um one of my very very good friends uh, and I um and one other set up a, um an early stage online sort of high-end consumer electronics business um and it was you know it was a great experience I was doing my exams at the same time so it was hard to give it the the time that maybe I would have liked to have done but we gave it some time um, and it did okay. You know, we, we, we ended up selling it, but, um, but we, we did okay. And, and um, you know, the main thing about that was the experience of being on the other side of the fence mm. to actually see what it looks like to start a business from branding to the financial side of it, obviously, uh, supply chain, um, building the back end of the website, all, all of that stuff became critical. Um, and to see it firsthand was was you know was very interesting but also it gives me a new perspective on when I you know when I sit down with clients a lot of my clients are in the tech space a lot of them are early stage as well I kind of know what they're going through genuinely not just oh, I, I say I know what you're doing I do know what you're doing um yeah. 
so that's I think that gave uh, um, a slightly different complexion to the way I advise people. Okay. And um, <clears throat> so you're obviously a partner in your current role. So what is it that you think, sort of similar to the question I asked before, but that's driven you to want to keep doing more and doing more and doing more? Is it, is it just an innate ambition or? Yeah. yeah. Basically, I, I, if there's a if there's a if there's a higher plane to reach, I want to reach it. Um, I, I'm very very hungry, uh, not just in the conventional sense. I am a bit hungry, actually, no. Um, but uh, it's it, it was always just something that became part of who I am. I, I didn't want. I would never settle. I can't settle. It's not something in my makeup. So um, I had set out an, uh, an even more ambitious target, which didn't happen. For one reason or another i went through my the, the businesses i was involved in without sort of laboring the point were involved with a couple of different mergers outside of my control they, they just were and so every time that happened it was a little bit like starting again which was very frustrating because you yeah. kind of you're kind of with a new bunch of people you know overseeing you and you have to prove yourself all over again which was annoying so there were i had two stop starts in my career which sort of put me back probably three or four years from where i originally set out to to end up I wanted to be a partner by 35 that was my goal I had to be a partner by 35 and I wasn't a partner until I was 38 so not by no means a disaster but I was a few years off um but these things happen and you have to be pragmatic and react and just deal with it not not sort of throw your toys out the pram about it there's nothing you can do um but when I made the decision a few years ago to move firms um the only role I would have taken was a partner role I you know I call it cocky or whatever you want to call it I just said to um, I had a lot of interest in me which was nice but I made it very clear on the opening exchanges that unless this role is a partner role thank you very much for the approach but I'm not interested um, and luckily every one of them wanted me as a partner um, so that was quite nice to sort of um, to experience um, yeah and I made the decision to go where I am and is being a partner everything you wanted it to be yeah, like, you know, I, I think um, there's always things that could go better. Like I said earlier, you, uh, in no way is my life perfection, um, my, my business, my work life perfection, but that's okay. Um, but I've loved building. It's almost like a business within a business. And I mean that with respect to all my fellow partners, because obviously it's, it's a, I'm, I'm surrounded by, with, there are 18 partners where I am. So, um, you know, it's, it's, and every one of them, plays a part right so but when I started I literally started genuinely 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 people don't don't always think I'm being 100% accurate here but I'm being 100% accurate here I started on day one with a blank piece of paper and a pen I was given no portfolio I had no portfolio waiting for me in common portfolio I started with a blank piece of paper um, and that for some people would be a wet their pants moment yeah for me, it was not until COVID happened. Then I may have wet my pants a little bit, but uh, we, we figured that one out too. Um, but no, it's it. I, I back myself. It, in, you know, it inherently back myself. I I thought, fine, you want to give me a, a blank piece of paper and a pen, I'll smash it. Um, and you know, I've outbuilt a lot of my fellow partners in two years. Um, you know, so um, that's been great. I've managed to put in a lot of big ticket work and interesting clients and and I, I've never struggled with that side of it to be honest with you I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a salesman I'm an accountant but I can sell you know if people uh, if people want want advice want to work with me I'm not bad at having that people um, relationship and making people feel safe in my presence um, so that they kind of go he's my guy he's the guy I can trust to give me the right advice um, so that's been you know pleasing satisfying humbling but um you know i'm sitting here with a really nice size portfolio now um and and i'm sort of proud of it i'm not ashamed to, to say it i'm proud of it yeah i love that i mean in a in a previous life i worked with accountants i was selling iris software yeah. which <clears throat> i don't think you guys use because i didn't uh, we don't we don't no, i didn't think you did. i've used it before but we don't sorry yeah um and accountants are terrible salespeople, you know, in terms of getting clients and selling themselves and all the rest of it. So 
it is a, a breath of fresh air um, to have somebody like yourself who is the complete opposite. And it reminds me of when my son was at college, he did graphic design. He's now working for Google, unbelievably. But, um, and he was never the smartest tool in the shed, if you like, in terms of the course he was on. But the, the lecturer said to me, if he went and he went to an interview, your boy would get it because he's got the, the charm. He's got the conversation, you know. Um, he's got that personableness that people like and warm to, which I'm guessing is the same for you. Yeah, it's so cliche, but people buy from people. Uh, you know, it's it's everyone says it and they roll it out like it's a catchphrase, but it's just bloody true. You know, it's um, uh, and you know, I'm quite lucky that in my space, on the whole, because there's plenty of, especially on LinkedIn, there's a couple of really really personable accountants on there who you are like following. But on the whole, accountants are not known for being overly comfortable in their own skin. You know, they are classic techies, backroom boys, people that will number crunch but put them in front of a group of people and they may not feel so comfortable. For me, that's never really been, well, as a kid it was, but you know, my adult life, that's never been an issue. I, I, I'm quite happy to work a room. I enjoy doing it. I don't find it difficult. Um, and uh, yeah, look, it, it just, it, I think beyond the technical and the academic side, the, the IQ, the you know, IQ intellectual, um, intellectual side of, of, of our being, there's also an emotional, uh, the EQ side of us, that I think is is as important, if not sometimes more important, especially being a, a, a leader, if I can call myself that, you know, I nurture people through and I watch for signs where people are you know, struggling and, and try and help people, clients, staff, the same. Um, so I think having EQ is as important as having a high IQ. Um, also, I think there's, um, there's an element of kind of street wiseness. It's not a word, but, you know, we'll go with it. It's street wiseness that is key to being a good advisor, business advisor, um, leader. You've got to be able to read a, a room. You've got to be able to read a situation. You've got to be able to think on your feet, find a solution to a problem. It's not just textbook driven. You know, you, I don't care. You can get 99.9% .9 in an exam and you might still be crap at your job. Um, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. Uh, I think that's the other thing that I think people fail to realise that, you know, just because you're getting A stars and everything you do, that doesn't mean you're going to be a good lawyer, accountant, banker, or whatever you go on to do. Um, there's a whole load of other stuff that comes into it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I totally agree with you. <clears throat> so what's being the ambitious person that you are? What's next for you? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, take over the world. No, <laughs> uh, I don't, you know, I don't have... Uh, a next plan because frankly I feel settled where I am now and that's a nice thing I'm, I'm no spring chicken anymore I definitely don't feel like one so you know I've done my hustle thing for a long time um, and worked very very hard and still working hard of course but actually uh, you know to to land somewhere and build on the ground is quite a nice feeling um, so my next step is just to continue to grow, you know, to grow my, my, my brand, my practice's brand, um, build my portfolio and be happy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, some, sometimes, you, you know, the, the problem with always looking up is that sometimes it's not happy to, it's not, uh, it becomes more difficult to look at where you are and be happy with where you are. Um, yeah. So I think that's something that, that um, at this age, I'm kind of more aware of. And I think, you know, you can always look up at, or look across at someone else and go, oh, he's doing, she, he's doing better than I am. Oh, I wish I could do that. But actually at some point you just kind of look and go, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing well for myself. I live in a, you know, I, I live comfortably. I can go on holiday when I want to go on holiday. I put food on my kids' plates comfortably. Um, you know, all those things become more important. And, and, um, and that's not a bad thing. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. So many people, the cliche, don't stop to smell the roses. Um, yeah. And you miss what's right in front of you, which um, is a real shame. Um, I've just noticed the keyboard in the corner there. So I also know that Lawrence is the singing accountant. So he shared some of his uh, beautiful songs um, on LinkedIn as well. Okay. Um, so, so, that wouldn't come up, but okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did so how did that come about? How did uh, I mean? How long have you been singing? Have you ever gone out and done it, pro you know, professionally or anything like that? No. Uh, 
I grew up, my mum's side, my dad's side of the family, the accountants, the finance people, my mum's side of the family, a lot of them, uh, there's a few lawyers in there, but a lot of them are creatives. Um, so art and music was something that I was surrounded by as a kid. I used to go to, you know, extracurricular art classes. I used to go everywhere with a sketchbook and a pad. And I, you know, I was always quite good at still life. I'm still, I haven't done it for years, but I used to love art. Luckily, my daughter's got that gene, definitely. She's very arty. And, um, and the music thing too. I remember with my, I'm Jewish, my bar mitzvah money, so I was 13, I smashed it all on a stupid keyboard, okay? My, my parents were like, are you sure you can do what you want with it? But, you know, you've got a nice chunk of money here, save it, invest it. I was like, no, no, keyboard. So I went and bought sort of a, a really, really top-end expensive synthesizer with floppy disk drive and everything back then. And I just started writing music. And I produced composition after composition, wrote the lyrics, used to record it on a cassette with my sister as background vocals. Um, I've still got them somewhere, but I, I, won't, uh, I won't release those. And, um, and so that was, that was always me. Music was a massive part of who I am. And then around, how old was I? I don't know. I don't know how old I was, but later in life, someone, a good friend of mine said, oh, there's a competition on YouTube to, to write a song to a beat. Someone had put a beat up. And I listened to the beat and I, I've always grown up, I, I loved R&B soul music and, and stuff like that. So I, I listened to the beat and it was right up my street and I thought I could do this. Uh, and I record, I wrote a song and recorded it and went to bed that night, woke up the next morning and I had, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of comments and likes and followers. And I just thought, okay. Um, and so my, my online presence there as well grew very, very rapidly. I, and my channel went sort of a little bit viral. I ended up on CNN and not for killing someone, which was uh, my to my, much to my parents' relief. Um, it, we, yeah, it's uh, one of the videos I was involved in was the, one of the most viral videos of, of 2010, I think it was. Um, so, you know, that, that was always um, something I loved. And again, a bit like LinkedIn, I built a community online for, for another time. I, I seem to be okay at doing that. I built a, a really nice community on that particular platform. And, but life gets busy. I got married, had kids, and so I didn't have time for it anymore. And, and if you take your eye off the ball, um, consistency is so important on social media. So if you take your eye off the ball, you go back six, seven months later, everyone's gone literally. Oh, really? it, well, they're, they're still there, but um, there's always a new flavor. Uh, and that's fine. You know, I'm, I'm not, uh, not sad about it, but that just happened. But during lockdown, um, I did have a little bit more time on my hands and I got out my keyboards and the mic and I thought, you know what, who cares? I don't, I don't care. I don't, I don't mind people judge me. I'm not interested. I'm not doing it for, for any other reason other than I want to do it. And if people like it, cool. If they don't like it, cool. Um, and so I, much to the surprise of a lot of people, including probably my partners, I, uh, <laughs> I, I decided to just stick a video up and it, it, you know, it the uh, reaction was really good. And so um, every now and again, I just drop another one. Um, and it's become a little bit like a, another catchphrase for me, but hashtag singing accountant is one that people um, know me for. And I even think it's weird because obviously as a partner and an accountant to get song requests in my inbox every now and again, is like, okay, all right, we'll go with it. So that's, you know, that's amusing to me. I kind of find that you know, it makes me chuckle. Um, so have you still got the YouTube channel? Because if you have, I'm subscribing. I do. I'll, I'll send it to you separately. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I have a separate cover. I do have it. I look. I try and keep it separate to my professional life, but it's become harder now because, obviously, now that I've shared it on LinkedIn, a lot of people have. You know, there's a lot of um, quasi FBI uh, FBI people out there who very quickly managed to find it online and sort of went, "Oh, that's you, isn't it?" Yeah, that's me. Yeah. Um, so it it is still out there. I don't really do anything with it anymore, but you know, I haven't deleted it, so it's still there yeah. in the ether. Um, okay. cool I'll check that out um well yeah I mean I what I was going to ask you and I don't know how you feel about this but um when I do this podcast I was gonna I was thinking about just doing a little snippet of your singing within it you can if you want to that's fine you so can. if you'd share like um a bit of a video with me and then I can just slice it in and then we can have it one, on two. that's that's absolutely fine with me it's out there anyway so it's not like I I'm not hiding it from anyone oh, I could probably take one from YouTube uh, no, no that's fine no, I can share I, I'll share it with you all right cool I was on LinkedIn I can send you one that's not a problem I wasn't right. um, I wasn't being difficult you can have it for sure um I'll share that with you cool um and the other thing I wanted to uh talk about which we talked about before we started recording was uh Lawrence saved the dolphin 
this year. What was it about two or three months ago? Yeah, it was in August. That was- Tell the story, uh, tell the story. Oh God, I think everyone's bored of me going on about my dolphin adventure, but I'll say it one more time for anyone who's heard this, and probably everyone's heard this, but um, yeah, I was on holiday in Spain and I have this uh, sort of terrible affliction that I get up early every day, even on holiday, I can't help it, my body clock absolutely sucks. Uh, so I was up 5.30, 6 o'clock, and rather than sit staring at the wall, I, especially when you're somewhere beautiful, uh, like Marbella is uh, like a second home to me, so kind of walked down to the beach um, in the darkness, which sounds a bit weird, uh, but I do it, and I just walk along the beach until sunrise, which is like an hour and a half later. I just walk up and down the, the coastline, it's a long coastline, and um, just breathe in the, the sea air, and uh, I, I just love it. It's a great way to wake up, a really sort of um, what's the word I'm looking for? It, cool. you rebalance doing that. It's a nice way to start your day. Um, but on that particular day, I woke up and shock horror because my bay, you know, Costa del Sol, it doesn't happen often, but it was absolutely storming. It was pouring with rain, lightning, thunder, pitch black because there was no moonlight or starlight in the sky. But I still thought, sorry, I'm going for a walk. Uh, and so I walked in the rain along the same beach I walk every morning. And on this particular morning, I heard something flapping in the darkness. I couldn't see it, it was pitch black, but I could hear something sort of splashing, splashing, splashing. And I thought, oh, that's weird. Um, put my phone um, torch on and shone it in the direction where I could hear the splashing. And I just saw a fin. And um, as I said to you offline, I, I did panic a little bit because I did think to myself, I'm gonna be the first person eaten by a shark on land, which would have been, which would have been novel. Um, but as I got closer, I had to get quite close because, as I said, it was, it was really, really dark. I realised a dolphin had obviously maybe in the storm, it was a baby dolphin, but still you know, big enough, um, had obviously injured itself maybe in the waves or whatever and was beached on, on the rocks, was bleeding a lot as well. Um, and I grew up, I, I love dolphins. I grew up sort of being completely obsessed with them. I swam with dolphins in Israel and, and I just... Tote, I had them on my wall, posters of dolphins on my wall, Athena posters, love them. And so it was like a magical moment for me. Um, but I looked around and thought, there is no one for miles. Everyone's asleep. No one's up at 5 30, 6 o'clock in the morning. No one does that apart from, you know, <laughs> so that, you know, that was that wasn't an option. There was no light, there was no lifeguard. I kind of thought, well, this dolphin is going to die if I don't save it. I have there's no, there's no choice here. I need to try and save this. Um, but it wasn't, I could I'm not gonna lie, it wasn't easy. I, um, as I said, I couldn't see. It was bleeding a lot. There was blood in the water. I watched Jaws as a kid, and I'm still scared stiff of going into the sea and being eaten by a shark. So, I, and I was convinced that was going to happen. Um, and it was just one of those like out of body experiences where I was kind of um, one handed because I, I needed to be able to see, and I recorded it for my kids because my kids also love dolphins. They would never ever have believed me in a million years if I'd gone back and gone, Daddy, just saved the dolphin. So, you know, that that had to happen. Um, but it took me the best part of, I reckon, 45 minutes on and off. To, uh, the video is only like two or three minutes because I just cropped it. But it took me ages to try and save it because every time it tried to swim out, it, the, the waves were rough, the sea was rough. It just kept crashing back onto the shore. But the, the happy ending is that it did swim off in the end. It, I saw it swim off. So it, um, you probably got eaten by that shark as it swam off. Oh no, don't say that. trying to get away from. But, um, but no, look, from my point of view, what a magical moment to, to have a dolphin looking, I was looking in its eyes, to look back at me kind of going like, help, you know, yeah. it was incredible. Uh, honestly, one of the most amazing experiences of, of my life. It was incredible. You believe in manifestation, I presume. A hundred percent. I've manifested so much in my life, I cannot tell you. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the power of just willing something. Um, I'm not going to tell you all the things that have happened, but so many things in my life have just been me going, this is happening. Yeah. No, no, it's just not, it's, it's not, not happening. It's happening. Even if it's completely beyond, I won't, I don't want to come across the sort of showy office. So I'm not going to tell you what happened, but there's at least two or three things where everyone was like, there is no chance of that happening, Lawrence. You, it's, you got no chance. And every time it's happened, just through absolute, kind of no way this is happening well now you've piqued my interest so um so what i was going to say about the manifestation is your obsession and love for dolphins i mean who else walking along the beach at that time in the morning to find a dolphin that needed your help you manifested that right because of your 
your love, your connection, your your being. Um, so you it, that was always going to happen at some maybe, point. Maybe um, I believe in in sort of fate as well. So that, you know, that had somehow that was meant to happen. Yes. Um, so come on, you've got to give me one of these experiences where you've manifested something. Oh, just it's, to, to be honest, it's sad because they're mostly material. So I I, I don't want uh, I'm not. Um, I probably am a bit materialistic, but I don't want to come across as materialistic. But things like you know maybe I a watch or a, a, a home or things little things like that, not little things, things like that where you just think you're never going to get that, mate. And then you forget it, not going to happen. Every one of them I've, I've got. I no, there's not one thing. I know that sounds really conceited, but I really don't want to come across that way because it's not really me. But every single thing that I've set out to achieve or to get or to have, every one of them I've got. There's not, a, a, I sort of sit back and I kind of go, you know, at some point it's going to catch up with me, God forbid. But at some point, you know, someone's going to slap me around the head and, and bring me back down. But but it's it's so amazing to me that I have been on this weird path where it's just bizarre. It, you know, so sometimes you just think there's someone up there. If you, I don't know, you, I'm, I'm quite spiritual in that sense. So yeah, I'm someone up there. Okay, me too. So there's someone up there that's kind of, willing me to to get that or helping me along to make sure things happen because you sometimes look at it and go the odds of me getting this particular thing is one in a million and I still get it and you're kind of going what's that you know I should buy a lottery ticket really shouldn't I but, yeah uh, absolutely that, that, maybe that's the next move going back to an <laughs> earlier question that's the next goal but um yeah so you know it's 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 a blessing it's a blessing and I work hard for it, but it's a blessing. Yeah, I was going to say, because, I mean, I'm a, I'm a very spiritual, uh, very much into manifestation. A lot of people manifest what they don't want because we're all, we're all focusing on the, you know, the fear of, the fear of not doing this, the fear of losing this, the fear of whatever. Um, and what you put your attention on, you attract. So, <clears throat> so it's, a, it's amazing that you've clearly got this self-belief and this energy and, and like you said the hard what you know you put all those things together and look what's possible um so yeah that it, that's not that's not you being arrogant that's not you being materialistic at the end of the day we are human beings um well spiritual beings having a human experience but we're still human so we still need material things so you shouldn't see it as arrogant or materialistic or whatever you know, why shouldn't you have a nice house and a nice life and nice holidays and all the rest of it, you know, and people will aspire to that. So that's why I was interested to know sort of what you've done, um, because, I, you know, I don't see it as arrogant. I see it as inspirational and more people should take a leaf out of your book in terms of, look, focus on what you believe in yourself, because a lot of people don't, you know. It's sad. I mean, that that for sure is... Um... I would I love inspiring people not because I'm anything you know inspirational as such but it's really not I didn't really have that much, you know, obviously my, my dad doing very well for himself was was an inspiration in some ways and one or two of the people I work with over the years were inspiring in their own way but I never really had anyone who fully put their arm around my shoulder and kind of went I'm going to help you along yeah. um which is fine. I'm not bitter about it, but I, I can do it. So I, I kind of love if anyone, um, I, I would like to think um, my staff would say, um, my staff, the staff I work with, I always say no one works for me, they work with me, but uh, the people I work with um, would say that I'm very, very um, human with the approach. Um, it's a heart approach. You know, I want to help as much as I can, I'm, I try and be, um, yeah, really, yeah, I say it again, really human with with the approach. Um, so I, in some ways, in that sense, I'd like to think that I'm inspiring for some of those guys who want to be future leaders. And we've just promoted three partners, actually, and I, and I definitely helped um, at least one of them um, through some 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 challenges. Um, you know, I think that that's a nice, that, that makes me feel good when I go go to bed at night, sort of think, yeah, you know, I help, I help them, I help them. Um, yeah. Just, Brilliant. Um, okay, well, I always like to finish these conversations with any pearls of wisdom that you might want to impart for the audience. Oh, God, you're asking me for wisdom. Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, nothing that I haven't said already, to be honest with you. It's just, you know, we get one crack at this. Um, be human, be humble, be kind, you know, be nice to the people around you. 
um, because that in itself is a manifest it, it's manifesting you know if you if you if you're a good person as good as you can be we all we're all flawed right no one's perfect we're all flawed we've all got things we could do better there's things that I look back on I think oh, I should have done that that was that was poor form Lawrence but I don't try and do that with intention I think if you're just a, a good person think good things will come work bloody hard you know um, there's a lot to be said for, for that hustle I, I mentioned earlier um, and aim high you know it's uh yeah, I think if, if you aim high, is it again, it's cliche, but if you aim high and you fall just a little bit short, you still hit high. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people are scared to push boundaries in life. They just don't do it. I think the other thing, which is something that I've discovered in myself the last year or two, is be authentic. Just don't, I don't care anymore. I really don't care anymore. Um, I'm almost militant about it. Um, I'm very comfortable in my own skin. I'm pretty thick skinned as well. If people don't like me. I get a lot of abuse, you know, even on LinkedIn couple of my posts oh you know ended up with 200 300 direct messages telling me what a bleep i am and i'm sorry people feel that way i don't think i am but people will you know for every 10 15 20 who like what you do there'll always be one or two that don't yeah it's fine it's okay no you do you i'll do me yeah. um so i think that's another thing i think being comfortable in your own skin and being authentic to who you are you'll be a much happier person being that way if you i i, I, I fell into the trap sorry one last point sorry I fell into the trap early in my career of wearing a mask. I, I felt like I had to conform to something that I felt they, they, the people around me, wanted me to be. And I can fake it for Britain. You know, I could, if you want me to stick on an Eton accent, I can do that. You want me to, you know, be a certain very corporate type of guy, I can fake it. Um, but it's just not who I am, really, deep down. And it took me a, a lot of years to figure it out that actually makes no difference. People react and respond better to you for being you than for being something that you, they think you want to be. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and that's it. Those are my pearls of wisdom. Not, not great, not great. No, they, they are great. They're, they're perfect. Um, absolutely. And, I, you know, one of my core values is authenticity. So I, and it is hard to be yourself. You know, I'm quite direct and, you know, that rubs people up the wrong way. And... I've got to an age, I, I guess it comes with age and wisdom and all the rest of it, but I don't care. No, uh, I don't care. It's very liberating that. Uh, look, I, I, as I said, right at the start of the conversation, I've still got to um, have a safety net there as well, because at the end of the day, I'm a professional. So I, I you know, I still have to rein it in a touch, um, but not to the point where I lose the authenticity in, in, in my approach. Um, so yeah, there, there's there's a there's a there's a, a boundary that I won't cross. Um, but I agree with you. Say it as it is. Say it how you feel it should be. Yeah. Um, and people will react well to it or not. And that's that's life. Perfect. So Lawrence, I've loved this time with you. Um, if people wanted to know more about you or connect with you, where would you like people to find you? I mean, LinkedIn is, is my is my um, second home these days, to be honest with you. So anyone who doesn't already know me and wants to um, the, the, the three three the, the, the three things I'm known for really are well, other than obviously being an accountant, are humor, suits and singing. So, you know, those are my my three USPs. If any of those things sound of interest, add me um, and uh, or connect with me. And uh, I always try try and reach out to everyone I connect with on a personal level um, to say hey uh, so hopefully that will um, yeah you'll enjoy it perfect well thank you so much again and, um, yeah just thank you and I know the listeners are going to love this I hope so everyone have a, a really good weekend and uh, it's been a pleasure meeting you properly Mel yeah you too Lawrence thank you no problem see you soon